Here we are with uh, Dr. David Cole for another AgriVisions podcast. Uh, this time uh, we want to talk about uh, our Beginning Farmer program and uh, the work we do with young producers. Dave? Yeah, it's almost like we're catching the new wave of agriculture coming in. And, you know, Nate, it's real interesting. Uh, people ask me, why do I still do this, you know? And, and uh, you know, what really lightens my passion is working with young beginning farmers and ranchers. I do possibly, you know, 20 to 25 of the programs like we're doing here with the bank around the country. And it's just so exciting. And uh, one of the things, uh, tell us a little bit about uh, your bank. And by the way, you're one of the few banks uh, that actually does one of these uh, type of programs. How did it all evolve and what, what does it constitute? Yeah, well, um Thanks, Dave. We started our beginning farmer program because of a strategic planning session. Uh, our ag division uh, annually gets together and, and uh, has a day retreat where we plan um, for the future. And at one of those sessions, we, yeah. we talked about demographics in the industry, yeah. what's happening, yeah. how it's changing, and how we could play a role. And, uh, and that's where the beginning farmer program was born. Um, we now call it our Emerging Farmer Program, um, and we, we do that because uh, lots of producers don't like to be called beginning. They mm -hmm. like to be uh, called emerging, and, and it's very true. They are emerging, yes. and they're, many of them are the leaders of our industry. Mm -hmm. um, it's interesting you talked about uh, how it energizes you. Mm -hmm. I think it energizes our team as well, myself mm -hmm. for sure, um, to be able to connect with the next generation really understand where they're coming from and, and it forces us as a bank to think about how we approach the market and, and we're approaching it with that next generation in mind. And one of the things I also enjoy doing your program, you have your team members right in with the folks uh, hearing the same things, you know, you've got a different part type of program and, and one of the things is that helps them build that alignment, that relationship as well. It really does. Uh, matter of fact, uh, especially our younger ag bankers, I, I really encourage them to, to be a part of the, the process throughout our sessions throughout the year. Uh, we, we meet four times uh, in the year. They're multiple day sessions intentionally, so there's networking time for those young producers to get to know each other as well, which is a real critical uh, uh, part of their learning process, right? They have to have uh, folks in similar situations that they can use as a sounding board and, and, uh, and visit and compare notes with. And I think one of the things that I, I like to see out of these programs, we're here to inform them, but also what are some of the actions that they can take back to their business, their family, and their personal life. But I think an important thing is there's fewer and fewer farmers and ranchers or emerging agriculturalists, and so this allows them to develop that network, uh, which the, can be a sounding board for new ideas or emotional support, like when we went through COVID and different things like this. I think that's uh, extremely important. Uh, are you seeing any ch different changes in our young farmer and ranchers? <laughs> you know, it's interesting. They're very technologically savvy. Oh. So when we talk about knowing their numbers, mm -hmm. um, they embrace that. You know, they, they use the tools out there to do it and they embrace it uh, probably more so than prior generations. That excites me. Yeah. Um, they're, they're entrepreneurial, oh. uh, you know, they have uh, other gigs, you might say. Matter of fact, uh, we, we have a set of twins in this year's program and uh, they own a dry cleaning business as well. So, um, you know, it's just an example of how they may have other W-2 income or they may have other businesses to help supplement their ag operations. Uh, very creative, very entrepreneurial uh, in their approach in some cases. Yeah, I've had anybody from being a welder to a trucker to uh, being a banker, uh, being an ag teacher, and uh, you know what they'll tell me, it's not only the income that they derive to help supplement their operation, but it's being out there and being aware, being interconnected with possible markets and new ideas. And so it, it's, I, I call them agri-entrepreneurs, emerging agri-entrepreneurs, and it really makes it exciting. By the way, you have a four-point program uh, Tell us about what you did that was outside the box. Uh, you went, uh, took the group over to visit uh, urban agriculture. <laughs> yeah, so we talked about the networking piece and we exposed them not just to people like themselves, but we'll bring in our Ag Advisory Board members. Mm -hmm. We'll bring in uh, Ag leaders around the region to expose them to them, to, to, to broaden their network. Mm -hmm. 
But then we want to also give them a chance to kick the tire. And so one of the, one of the four sessions, we we'd load up in a bus and we head out and, uh, and look at agriculture outside their farm, outside the farm gate. And uh, we take them to metropolitan areas. We take them to uh, manufacturing. We take them to processing. Um, and uh, give them a chance to look at what urban agriculture looks like and what are the trends there. And what's that mean to agriculture back on their farm? Um, you know, we, we know about ESG and you know, the environmental, social, and governance. What's that mean long term for these producers as they go through their careers in agriculture? And uh, you know, heightening their awareness to that, I think, is a, is a really important part of what we try to do. Yeah, and I think, uh, you know, we have that dairy creamery back in Virginia, and we have two outside board members, and it's one of, been one of the best things because they bring new ideas uh, uh, to uh, outside-the-box type of thinking, and uh, we've got to do that in today's environment uh, and uh, in preparing these uh, folks for the future. You know, another trend that I'm noticing uh, with the young beginning farmers, uh, more women, uh, and in... Uh, areas of the country I'm seeing more minorities uh, and it's just a, it's just a whole new group that is not picked up in the USDA statistics on farmers and ranchers and uh, so I really see this uh, changing out there. Nate, uh, what's, uh, what do you think is kind of the recipe for success? Uh, I'll, I'll give one, you give one, but one of the things you talked about the financials critical for young farmers and ranchers or emerging uh, producers is uh, they've, the family living budget's just as important as the farm budget. And, uh, you know, when we talk about, hey, use Quicken or use some financial tool to, mod you know, monitor the farm financials, they get it. And uh, it requires some sacrifice. If, if they're going to grow their business, they're going to require some personal sacrifice, and so I really stress the importance of those family living budgets. Anything that your team stresses out there? Yeah, I mean that's a, that's a given, and we'd certainly endorse what you just talked about. I think one of the things we will really try to get across to our young producers, and it goes back to the networking, but but the people skills. You know, a lot of times uh, we think in agriculture, you know, we're we're out in the tractor. It's a, it's an independent business where we don't have to communicate and, and build relationships and that couldn't be further from the truth especially as we go into a more dynamic uh, world a more dynamic and volatile environment mm -hmm. those partnerships both inside the business your, your, your key partners and employees inside your farm and ranch business and then those others outside that we've talked about that you do business with whether it be the bank the seed company the elevator uh, you name it the co-op um, developing trusting loyal relationships there is going to be really a critical skill set and so we'll be introducing them to behavioral styles we'll be introducing them to how to how to better understand and connect uh, at a human level and i think for uh, for agriculture that's that's critical as we're such a small part of the population we better be able to connect with people both ag and non-ag and tell our story and I, I also enjoy watching you teach that session because all of a sudden uh, we'll have uh, spouses, partners in there. And, uh, we see some of the elbows <laughs> under the table and the ribs, uh, like when we play basketball or you play <laughs> linebacker in football. Yeah. But, it, it, you know, those personality styles, I will have to say that was probably one of the, the 10 best management practices uh, I got introduced to that way back in the 1980s, and boy, that helped me so much in, in my life. You know, another thing I think is real critical is developing those financial statements, whether it's the balance sheet and the cash flow, and then monitoring them. You know, I, as I'll tell the group, 80% of uh, a business plan is that cash flow because you got to think through production, marketing, finance, and uh, uh, risk management and then the key is monitoring it and uh, in today's inflationary environment things can compound and get out of control very very quickly and uh, it's really fun just to see the folks uh, really embrace this and uh, often uh, they're a little bit lower equity uh, they are a higher risk uh, to the bank's portfolio but what happens is if they do these and have their goals articulated to you, 
it reduces that risk component. Doesn't mean that they're going to be successful, but it puts the odds in their favor, right? I couldn't agree more. And to your point about building their financial horsepower, and you talked about the family living budget, but the business budget as well. I'll give you a, a re recent example. And because commodity prices are high, there's, a, there's another level of optimism out there too in some mm -hmm. people right now. And there's mm -hmm. soybean crush plants getting built mm -hmm. and there's these things going on. We had a, one of our uh, beginning farmers from one of our very first classes who we've been uh, in dialogue with here over the past several weeks. And he wanted to stick uh, money into one of these new soybean crush plants. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's a great investment, but the conversation we had with him is, can you afford to pull that money out of your business, mm -hmm. uh, lose that liquidity, that access to that liquidity? Once you stick it into that, you know, you don't know when you'll get back at that capital. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a great conversation, and we weren't trying to discourage him from doing it. We wanted him just to evaluate his options really thoroughly. And in the end, he decided to keep it inside the business. He felt like working capital was more valuable to him than that investment opportunity. That may not always be the case, mm -hmm. but it was really fun process to go through that analysis with him and help him just really think that through mm -hmm. and decide what's best for his business today. And I think making them critically think and think about the unintended consequences exactly. uh, uh, in a mature manner uh, rather than an emotional manner is very, very critical. Well, Nick, I want to give you a shout out for, and the bank a shout out for investing in the uh, future of agriculture. And uh, uh, again, uh, it's kind of like throwing a pebble in a pond. Uh, the ripples go on forever. And so I want to commend you, uh, you, the bank, and the leadership teams for investing uh, in the future of agriculture. And remember, agriculture is the foundation behind, uh, you know, the pyramid of the success of the United States of America. Appreciate that very much, Dr. Cole, and uh, it gives our team great passion to do it. So uh, thanks for being with us for another AgriVisions podcast.